Howdy, Eco Nerdlings! In this podcast, we're going to be discussing the pros and the cons of pesticide usage. So, one of the biggest pros of pesticide usage is that it helps save human lives through disease control. So, it helps to prevent insect transmitted diseases such as malaria, which is caused by the Anopheles mosquito, the bubonic plague, which was caused by rat fleas. We don't see a lot of that um, anymore, obviously, but in the Middle Ages, that was a huge contributor to thousands upon thousands, if not millions, of deaths. Uh, and that's something you learn a lot about in your history classes. Uh, typhus, which is caused by body lice and fleas. And sleeping sickness, which is caused by the tsetse fly. And I believe that's mostly found in Africa, so you don't have to worry about it too much here in the United States. Um, so one of the other pros is food production. It helps to increase food supplies, and it helps to lower food costs. About 55% of the world's food supply is actually lost to pests. So 35% of that occurs before harvest, and 20% of that occurs after harvest. These losses would be a lot worse, and food prices would be a lot higher if we didn't use pesticides to help control that. So fiber production is also a pro of pesticides. So we use fibers such as cotton to make all of our shirts, a lot of them anyways, some of them we use animals such as sheep, um, but as far as pesticides grow, they help to prevent the eating of cotton by pests such as the cotton boll weevil, and it helps us to keep the, the cost of clothing down. So the efficiency when compared to the alternatives of pesticides. So pesticides control most pests very quickly and at a reasonable cost. They have a very long shelf life, so they don't expire very quickly, meaning we don't have to buy it every you know, week and then it deactivates. So they're going to last for a pretty long time. Uh, they're pretty easy to ship and they're pretty easy to apply. They're safe when they're handled properly. And when genetic resistance occurs, farmers can easily use a stronger dose or they can switch to another pesticide. Uh, proponents feel that they're safer than the actual alternatives. So what about the development of safer pesticides, such as botanicals and microbotanicals? Uh, they're safer to users and they're less damaging to the environment. However, a lot of the development that goes into those is very, very costly. Uh, another huge controversial alternative to pesticides is genetic engineering, uh, which holds promise in developing pest-resistant crop strains. Now, a lot of genetic modification or genetic engineering has already happened uh, in crops such as wheat and corn. And, you know, genetic engineering, genetically modified organisms, that is a huge debate right now in the scientific world. Uh, lots of debate in the food industries as well. That's, again, another thing that we've seen uh, when we watched the documentary Food, Inc. It talked a little bit about genetically modified organisms. Uh, GMO doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It just means that it has been genetically modified. Uh, a lot of research still needs to go into seeing long-term effects of this. Um, one of the cons to developing safer practices or safer pesticides is that it is very expensive to develop these. And most of the development for these is only targeted or geared towards the very large pro cro uh, crops such as wheat, corn, and soy. So what are some of the problems that are associated with pesticide usage? Well, we have a huge impact on non-target organisms, meaning kind of like innocent bystanders. Similar to bycatch, so we go out on a boat and we want to catch tuna. Well, we put out our huge nets and we bring in all of the fish and we have a ton of bycatch. We're catching different species of fish, we're catching sharks, we're catching marine mammals and turtles and all of that bycatch. Same thing happens with pesticides. We're killing off a lot of different organisms that we're not really targeting. So pesticides don't just stay put. The USDA says that only 2% of the insecticides from aerial or ground spraying actually reach the target pests. So that's saying that 98% of that basically just goes off into the environment. And only about 5% of herbicides that are applied to crops reach the target weeds. The rest of them, again, end up in the environment. They can end up in the air, the water supply, the soil. So we also have the development of what we call superbugs. So these are genetic resistance. Uh, these superbugs have a genetic resistance to pesticides. 
uh, insects breed extremely rapidly. So within five to 10 years, uh, sooner in some cases in the tropics, they can develop immunity to specific pesticides and they can come back stronger than before. So for example, we apply a pesticide to a population of, we'll just say 100 insects. Well, that pesticide kills off 98 of those insects. We're great, those 98 you know, insects are gone, but we have two that had some type of mutation or genetic you know, predisposition to being resistant to that pesticide. Well, guess what? They breed and then their offspring breed and those offspring, offspring breed. And eventually we have a huge population of insects that are now genetically resistant to that pesticide. Same thing happens with bacteria and other types of living organisms as well. So weeds and plant disease organisms can also become resistant. Currently, we have 520 insect and mite species, 273 weed species, 150 plant diseases, and 10 rodent species, mostly rats, that have developed genetic resistance to pesticides. That's a lot of species that have started developing genetic resistance to pesticides. And at least 17 insect pest species are resistant to all major classes of insecticides. So we have super pests, uh, which are resistant to pesticides. So for example, the silver white fly has challenged farmers and they have caused over $200 million of loss in crops per year in the United States. So a case study in this unit is growing germ resistance to antibiotics. So this is something, again, you've probably heard a lot about of in the news, the superbugs, uh, MRSA, uh, a lot of strains of bacteria not being able to be treated by antibiotics so people are dying from bacterial infections. Uh, this is a rapidly producing infectious bacteria and they're becoming genetically resistant to widely used antibiotics due to, number one, genetic resistance. So the spread of bacteria around the globe by humans uh, the overuse of pesticides, which produce pesticide-resistant insects that carry bacteria. So as far as bacteria goes, say, all right, I go to the doctor, I actually have a bacterial infection, he gives me antibiotics. He gives me a seven-day dose of antibiotics. I take them, but by day four, I'm like, you know what, I don't feel bad anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm not going to take the extra three days. Well, what happens is that in those four days, my antibiotics have killed off about 85% of the bacteria or even 95% of the bacteria. So of course I'm feeling really good. So when I don't take the rest of the antibiotics, that 15 to 20% uh, of, of bacteria, they're now left to reproduce. So by not taking all of your antibiotics, you're leaving the stronger bacteria there behind to continue to reproduce and then you'll have to get put on a stronger antibiotic. So if you ever do get assigned antibiotics or prescribed antibiotics, take the whole pack. Um, another leading into that uh, reason for our bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics is the overuse of antibiotics. So again, a lot of times people go into the doctor and they have a cough or they don't feel good. And when you go to the doctor, you kind of expect them to give you something. And they know you kind of are expecting, you know, I go in, give me some type of medication to make me feel better. Well, unfortunately, antibiotics are hugely overprescribed. So I go in and I cough. They don't do a test to see is it a bacterial or is it a viral infection. The doctor writes me a prescription for a broad spectrum, um, broad spectrum antibiotic. Here you go, I take it. And eventually, when you're taking so many antibiotics, all of these bacteria are starting to become more and more resistant to those antibiotics. So, and then persistence. So many pesticides actually stay in the environment for a very long time. Biggest example that we keep seeing come up over and over and over is DDT because it was a pesticide that was so hugely used uh, then we didn't know all of the effects that it was gonna cause until later on when it went up the food chain, bioaccumulated, and caused all kinds of havoc on everything. So it caused bioaccumulation. Uh, bioaccumulation is an increase in the concentration of a chemical in a specific organ or tissue at a higher level than normal. So for example, we use DDT and you know gets on the plants. Then something eats the plants, bioaccumulates in that organism. Something eats the insect that eats the plants, something that ate whatever ate the insect, it eats the plants, so on and so forth. 
and we get this bioaccumulation. And all of these chemicals get stored in our fat storage. So wherever we have fat, that's where a lot of the toxins get stored. So it bioaccumulated in the fat portions of organisms. And it's usually a concern for organisms that are much higher on the food chain. Uh, not just DDT, and I, we spoke about this in a previous video lecture, but we talked about all of those belugas at the St. Lawrence River, where they had a huge bioaccumulation of toxins in their blubber, which caused their young to die whenever they nursed because there were so much toxins in their fat that their breast milk had huge amounts of toxins in it and were killing the babies. Uh, same thing with fish. Uh, we are warned not to eat large fish, um, you know, because of mercury poisoning or to only eat a certain uh, amount of these different types of fish because of the mercury poisoning and mercury bioaccumulation in those fish. So typically the larger the organism, or I shouldn't say larger, the higher up on the trophic level it is, the more bioaccumulation of the toxin it will have. So we also have formation of new pests. So it's turning of minor pests into major pests. Uh, a lot of times the pesticides actually kill off the natural predators of the pests, or they kill off the parasites and the competitors that the pests uh, might have been killed by to begin with. So that pesticide actually allows the pest population to develop a resistance rebound. And instead of killing the pest, now the pesticide has killed off all of the natural predators or all of the natural organisms that would have kept that pest in check. Again, example, DDT to control insect pests on lemon trees, it actually caused an outbreak of a scale insect that had not been a problem in, uh, in the beginning. So we also have food and water contamination, so pesticides that we use run off into our water as we spray for bugs, and a lot of times they'll actually stay in our food. So a lot of times they actually warn us um, if it's not organic. A lot of times it's a good idea, especially um, on foods, to peel them. Anything with a thin peel, such as apples, pears, peaches, uh, those types of uh, plants or you know vegetables, fruits, all those types of things, you want to peel uh, if there's something that has a very, very thin skin. Citrus fruits, things like that that have a thick skin aren't really bad for you. Uh, you can look more of that up. Uh, if you want to Google the Dirty Dozen, it talks about foods that are really bad to eat that aren't organic because they have so much pesticides uh, in their skins. So pesticide poisoning is becoming more of a problem in the United States as well as other areas around the world. Um, we have short-term exposure to high levels of pesticides that can result in harm to organs, and it can even cause death. And then we have long-term exposure to lower levels of pesticides that can lead to cancer. Uh, children, unfortunately, are at a greater risk than adults are. So some of the symptoms of pesticide poisoning include nausea, vomiting, and headaches. Uh, more serious uh, results can be damage to the nervous system and other body organs. So for example, the World Health Organization estimates that more than 3 million people are poisoned by pesticides each year. And unfortunately, about 220,000 people die a year because of pesticide poisoning. So the National Cancer Institute has actually put out a bunch of literature and there's a lot of research going on to look at the correlation between pesticides and increases in cancer. So pesticides have been shown to cause lymphomas, leukemia, brain, lung, and testicular cancers. There's still a lot of debate going on whether or not certain pesticides cause an increased risk to breast cancer, uh, and that's still kind of up in the air. We're still doing more research, more testing on that. Uh, researchers have noted, though, that there is a correlation between a high level of pesticides in the breast fatty tissue and cancer. So basically what that says is that if there's a high amount of uh, pesticides in the fatty tissue of a woman's breast, that has cancer, it's kind of correlated. So they test them, the person has cancer, they look at the fat of that breast, and they've noticed that in the fat of the breast that had the cancer, there's a lot of pesticide residue. So it's bioaccumulated in the fatty tissue of the breast. Now again, that's just a correlation. We don't know if that's the cause of the breast cancer, but it's just noted that the people that have breast cancer uh, some of them that have been tested and had their uh, fatty tissue of the breast tested, 
that it had shown there were pesticides in there. So how do pesticides function? Meaning what exactly do they do? Well, we have what we call an LD50 or the median lethal dose. The LD50 is the amount of pesticide it will take in one dose to kill half of the target organisms. So if I have 50 mice and I give them a certain concentration of whatever rodenticide that I'm using and half of them die, then that's my LD50 for that experiment. Um, it's usually referring to rats and mice in a laboratory experiment. So we have pesticides that affect the nervous system. Uh, some interfere with the nervous system and can cause uncontrollable muscle twitching or paralysis. Some are nervous system poisons, and uh, those are spectricides, nicotine, DDT, durospan, and diozenone. Uh, we have ones that are photosynthesis inhibitors, so they actually inhibit or prevent photosynthesis and chlorophyll formation from occurring. Uh, examples of those would be stampede and parazone, so obviously if we're talking about photosynthesis, this would be a type of herbicide. And then smothering. So vapors actually kill the pest by suffocating the animal. Soap can actually smother soft bodies of insects. So for example, some of the um, products used for that are flea collars, the pest strip, and soap. Uh, dehydration. Uh, dehydration uses fossilized remains of tiny one-celled organisms called diatoms. And they kill insects by actually scratching that outer waxy layer or their cuticle uh, covering and it causes them to dehydrate so they lose all of their water. And this is a soft pesticide. Uh, the inhibition of blood clotting. This is another type of pesticide and it's uh, typically used in rats and mice and it causes them to bleed to death by preventing their blood from clotting. So what is the ideal pesticide? Well, the ideal pest killing pesticide chemical has all of these qualities. Uh, it kills only the target pest. It does not cause any type of genetic resistance in the target organism. Uh, it disappears or breaks down into harmless chemicals after doing its job, such as water or carbon dioxide, something like that. Uh, and it would be more cost effective than doing nothing. Now, does that ideal pesticide exist? It might, but we haven't really found it yet. So again, examples of that pesticide, it would break down into safer materials such as water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and it would stay exactly where it was put and not move around in the environment. And again, right now, there is no such thing. But you guys, your generation, you guys have a lot of problems to deal with, so maybe one of you will find the perfect pesticide. Well. I hope you guys learned a lot about pesticides, uh, some of the pros and cons, as well as how they work, uh, a little bit more educated about them. If you need to rewatch this video lecture or any others, you can find them on my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.